All right, so hearing none, um, what I want to just discuss is a little bit of work that we've been doing with our RCCI series hybrid vehicle, uh, and then talk about the future, all right? So uh, this picture that you see here was taken by our publicity department. Uh, Sage is, uh, was one of my PhD students who's now an assistant professor in our group. And Reed back here, I showed you his results on the transient engine. Uh, he's a postdoc now. Uh, he and uh, some of the undergraduates in our SAE car projects worked on this uh, vehicle. Uh, they installed two fuel tanks. So we have one for diesel and one for gasoline. Um, and they have some really interesting pictures showing uh, there's some gas stations where both of those pumps are available right there. And you can fill the car in one go. So it's pretty interesting. And here's the GM 1.9 liter engine um, that was used. Uh, so let me just describe, first of all, the, the architecture. This is a series hybrid engine. Parallel hybrid is like you'd find in the Honda Insight. Basically, the engine is driving the wheels. Uh, uh, and um, so the engine is always driving the wheels. The electric motor here is just an assist in that process. Uh, so that's uh, one form of hybrid. The series hybrid is what we have in our design. Uh, it's definitely not nearly as sophisticated. Here the engine is driving a generator, a charger, which charges the batteries, and the batteries are then used to drive the wheels. Uh, so that's a, a much simpler system to implement. And then the series parallel configuration, like in the Toyota Prius, is a combination of both of those designs. So the engine uh, is driving a generator and the wheels uh, and so you, and of course the electric motor is also driving the wheels. So you, you can actually benefit significantly from having the series uh, parallel configuration. Ours is the series hybrid, just to remind you. So here's what the engine system looks like. <coughs> we have the GM 1.9 liter engine uh, in the engine bay. It's connected to a 90 kilowatt uh, generator motor. Uh, the uh, battery system is a Johnson Controls 14 kilowatt hour battery. It takes up a lot of the trunk. Uh, and then here we have the drive motor, 75 kilowatt drive motor driving the wheels. All of this was put together by students at the University of Wisconsin. All we did was work on the, uh, in, in the engine research center part of this program on the engine itself. So the engine itself, I don't have to spend time on this, is the GM 1.9 liter engine that we've been, we've been discussing here. Um, we did have, uh, we used those RCCI pistons that I mentioned, and we replaced the stock pistons with pistons I'll show you in a minute. Uh, we used port fuel injection 96 uh, research octane number gasoline that we bought from a gas station. And the DI fuel was 46 C10 number U, uh, ultra low sulfur diesel. Here's the piston. <clears throat> so we replaced the stock piston with a much uh, more disc shaped design. And we made an attempt to reduce the crevice height here uh, by a factor of two to try to deal with some of the hydrocarbon issues. We're not totally successful, but this is uh, a first step in that direction. Okay, so uh, having uh, assembled the uh, car, uh, it drives. I went on test drives with my students. It's kind of interesting. You could switch between conventional diesel or RCCI just by flipping a switch on the dashboard, or you could operate with just uh, the batteries. So we were fortunate to uh, be able to use the Ford Vehicle Emissions Research Lab to uh, test out the engine. Uh, and this was done in a real hurry. I just have to explain that to you because <clears throat> it was done over Christmas break or just after Christmas when the Ford people were all away and their lab was available. Uh, so we didn't get a lot of time. But basically the idea was to see if we could characterize the engine. Uh, we didn't have any uh, after treatment system installed on the engine. We just simply wanted to see from a fuel efficiency perspective and if we uh, made some assumptions about the after-treatment system, how would that uh, work? And we compared the results over three cycles, the FTP 75, the Highway Fuel Economy Test, and the US 06 test, and I'll just show you briefly some of those results, uh, against the Volt. 
right? A commercially, uh, Chevy bought a commercially available engine, uh, vehicle rather, um, with a lot of obviously commercial development behind it. Um, the drive motor in uh, uh, ours is slightly smaller. It has some limitations. The generator and the battery are similar. Um, so that's what we uh, set out to do. So uh, when we arrived, uh, the first thing we did was to run the US06 uh, cycle, which is basically a high-speed cycle. Um, we also explored starting the engine both in diesel mode or in ICCI mode. And we also explored briefly looking at different power levels. Since the engine is running independent of the wheels, you can run at uh, a very efficient engine operating point, for instance, to charge the battery, and then use the batteries to um, drive the wheels. Uh, we also had to make some modifications because the satin view is actually heavier than the vault. So there were some uh, adjustments that had to be made on the Ford uh, chassis dynamometer platform. But that was done. Uh, we chose the Volt because it's also a car very similar to the Saturn view. Um, we also made sure that we, or tried to make sure that we operated over each test cycle in a charge sustaining mode. That means that the battery state of charge at the beginning of the test and the end was the same. Uh, we didn't have any after treatment system installed. Uh, more recently, uh, a month or so ago, we went to Oak Ridge with the same vehicle and started testing it on the chassis dynamometer. And we found f using their system that some of the assumptions that, that we had made about after treatment system were borne out. So that was very nice. Um, we didn't have any regenerative braking. So that basically is about a 10 to 20% penalty in our results compared to the Volt. Um, so that has to be borne in mind. Also, those pistons, we obtained them Two weeks before we went down there, we hadn't run them in much. So basically, we still think that there's, these are very preliminary results. Uh, we didn't have feedback pressure control. So basically, the uh, students used uh, the sound of the engine mostly uh, to help calibrate it. OK, so here's the engine load speed uh, operating space for RCCI. Um, you can see here that we wanted to make sure we kept pressurize rates below 10 bar per degree. We also didn't use any EGR uh, in the system to, for simplicity. Uh, and the operating points that we chose were the 10 kilowatt, 15, 22, and 32 kilowatt uh, operating points for the engine itself. Uh, we had some trouble uh, at the high operating point uh, again, it was just because of lack of time, so we focused mostly on these lower operating points. Um, we used a double direct injection strategy with between 60 and 80 percent port fuel injected fuel, uh, no EGR, and stock intake pressures from the turbocharger system, and that put the brake thermal efficiency in the in the upper 30 percent range here. Uh, we know that we can do better than that if we operate it at the high, uh, high load operating point. Um, we want to make sure that the exhaust temp the gas temperatures were above 200 C. So that's why we didn't operate down here. We operated at the minimum of uh, 10 kilowatt or 4 bar roughly. So this shows the FTP drive cycle. Uh, it's vehicle speed versus time. And you can see that there's three phases here, a cold start phase that lasts about, uh, what's that, nine minutes. Then there's a uh, transient phase, uh, and then you stop, and then you start up again, a hot start phase. Uh, and I don't know what this really represents, but it's basically uh, the, the engine speed over some course uh, that involves uh, stop and go driving uh, in rush hour traffic. Um, so basically, this was what the, uh, when the engine, the vehicle was on the chassis dyno, what the vehicle uh, was required to reproduce. And <clears throat> this just shows some of the first data we got. Um, here we're looking at hydrocarbons and CO um, and nitric oxide, all right? And you can see that during the uh, test here, we started up actually on electric. Uh, on the, on the batteries, 
And there were some issues with startup using uh, diesel startup. We saw some um, fairly large NOx spike, uh, and then relatively low NOx. And eventually, uh, the hydrocarbons, we also did some on-the-fly calibration changes to just try to reduce, um, in this case, the CO. Uh, anyway, th these are the results from that FTP uh, cycle test. This shows the cumulative uh, hydrocarbons uh, and CO, and then the, the NOx. And you see most of the NOx came from that startup uh, point. Um, the particulates uh, were also monitored using the Ford vehicle lab uh, equipment. You see they were fairly low, uh, but if you take the accumulated or so cumulative particulates, we saw around 0.04 gram per mile uh, from the engine. Okay, so how do these numbers compare, say, with the, the Volt? Um, so this was the raw data from that first test. Uh, and over here you see the corresponding data from the vault for hydrocarbons, CO, NOx, and particulate. Uh, we didn't have data available from the vault for particulate. Um, as you can see, we get high hydrocarbons compared to the vault. Uh, that's partly because we're operating at uh, a light load operating point, 10 kilowatt, four bar. Uh, we know from steady, steady state tests on that same engine that we can reduce hydrocarbons by going to higher uh, uh, loads, uh, you know, like six bar or higher. Uh, if we added a catalyst that was operating at 98.5% efficient, we could drop the hydrocarbons to the, the number that you see here. And if in addition we used EGR, a small amount of EGR, we could get to numbers uh, like you see here. We also thought that the calibration, the engine calibration, looking at the results later and comparing them with the results on the, on the, on the steady state tests, that some improvements to the calibration could also be used. And with that, we could get into the range seen by the Volt for hydrocarbons. Our CO was actually better than the Volt, and the NOx, without any NOx control, uh, was a little higher than the Volt, but still very low. So <clears throat> some of these uh, assumptions, like the efficiency of the catalyst, as I mentioned, we actually verified that at Oak Ridge a few months after these tests were done. Uh, it was charge sustaining, and we actually made a little bit more power than, uh, than would have been required to keep the beginning and ending state of charge the same. So if you take all of that into account and you compare <coughs> what uh, we measured and then extrapolate to, say, the 30 kilowatt point, which we were not running, we saw fuel efficiencies that were similar or better than the Volt without the 20% benefit that the Volt gets from regenerative braking. So we were pretty happy to see these results. Uh, there's a lot more work that needs to be done to, you know, verify these, uh, but just for a bunch of students going to a, a vehicle lab during vacation, uh, we were very excited to see them. We also uh, looked at the EPA highway fuel economy test. So this is rural and interstate highway driving with a warmed engine. Here's the speed versus time uh, that is required uh, to meet that test. Um, Similar table here showing comparisons with the Volt uh, hydrocarbon, CO, NOx, and particulates. Uh, and again, doing the analysis, um, here we ran with, I think this was with the, the 15 and 20 kilowatt. Yeah, we ran with 15 kilowatt here. Um, operating points, five, six bar uh, VMEP. Here we found that our uh, projected fuel efficiency was again uh, comparable to the, the Volt um, without considering regenerative braking. And then finally, for the US06 test, this is the test that uh, you would run this one, uh, basically you're running at 80 miles per hour at some parts of the test here. This would be uh, on your highway and city driving with an aggressive acceleration and braking. Uh, there's also 
bunch of stuff that happens at the end here that's kind of interesting, uh, where you're slowing down, starting up, and so on, as you come off a ramp, I guess. Um, here, just a summary again of the results. Uh, here we ran at 20 kilowatts with an assumed catalyst of the uh, efficiencies that I mentioned before. Um, and the volt, you can see we're higher on hydrocarbons, uh, lower on CO, and higher on nitric oxides. Um, the fuel efficiency in this case was similar to the vault um, without the re regenerative braking. So we thought this was pretty encouraging. So we successfully installed these, the pistons, these new uh, pistons on our engine. Uh, we think there's additional work that can be done to further lower hydrocarbon and CO uh, with better piston design. Uh, we operated over three different power levels with three different federal cycles. As I mentioned, it would probably have been better to operate at the highest uh, efficiency point for all of the cycles. And essentially, what you would do then is you would have to have more stops and starts, uh, but that's something that could be optimized. Uh, preliminary results were encouraging. So, you know, as I said, we hadn't really broken in the engine. We had not done any dyno or CFD testing for those pistons. Um, so we were essentially working on the fly here. Uh, but the results that we did get were similar to those we've seen in steady state tests uh, in the lab. We don't think it's optimal. The fuel economy is comparable then to the Chevy Volt, but without uh, regenerative braking and rough calibration. So we think we have an actual potential for as much as 20% improvement over the vault. Uh, so the future tests, uh, good news and bad news here. We took the vehicle down to Oak Ridge National Lab and uh, was a lot of difficulty getting it down there, but we got it done. We've got it on the dynamometer and we started the federal test procedure. We got through most of that and the gearbox failed. <laughs> So this is something that was designed by undergraduates, um, and they apparently needed some more coaching. Uh, um, so we, what we did was we then continued the testing at steady state points using their emissions equipment, but not doing the, the full uh, FTP and uh, USO6 cycles. And we used that to basically study the DOC and DPF and so on. And that data is still being analyzed, but basically it, it did verify the assumptions that we made uh, on, our, on the performance of the after-treatment system uh, for, from the Ford tests. Okay, so RCCI, you can see I'm interested in that because of the combustion control, uh, but it's basically only one of, of what I consider to be advanced engine combustion strategies that have the promise for improved fuel efficiency and reduced emissions with, uh, without the complexity of some of the alternative emissions handling systems. Uh, for RCCI, we've seen those results in single and multi-cylinder engines, also vehicle tests, and we've shown that we can operate this over a wide uh, load speed range. We can meet EPA emissions in cylinder with efficiencies greater than 55%. In fact, I even showed you up to 60%. For light duty engines, NOx and PM emissions with less EGR than is required with the conventional diesel, uh, it can be used and is shown. Uh, Multi-mode light duty engine RCCI is also possible. So for instance, we can use conventional diesel at idle uh, operate without any EGR up to a relatively high load point. And then beyond that point, we can actually go transition back to diesel operation. Um, but that's outside of the regulated uh, area for the FTP test, for instance. Uh, RCCI modeling indicates that, uh, indicated that we could get an 8% improvement in fuel consumption over conventional diesel with uh, selective catalytic reduction. Uh, over the FTP cycle with the same engine and the same turbocharger system and so on. Uh, and we could meet tier two bin five emissions uh, without the need for NOx after treatment or a DPF, but a DOC would be required for unburned hydrocarbon and CO reduction. 
Uh, also, the results that I discussed today showed that further optimization of RCCI with higher boost pressure, higher piston temperatures, reduced swirl, uh, going to a different piston material, optimized crevice design, those are all parameters that we think would provide as much as another 10% improvement. Future experiments and modeling, basically in the heavy duty and the light du duty engines, uh, we'll continue to explore RCCI. And we're doing that at our labs now with uh, redesigned pistons, uh, alternative fuels. Uh, I showed you also the two injector layouts uh, that we're using in the heavy duty engine. Uh, so we have a number of things still going, ongoing to try to uh, further characterize this combustion strategy. All right, so now I want to start, kind of finish up by talking about uh, new directions. <coughs> um, they are required, obviously, to improve the efficiency of fuel utilization on our planet. Uh, we need to basically balance emissions, fuel cost, and market competitiveness, all right? Um, there's definitely a place for CFD modeling, and that's why I focused a lot of my discussion in the last week here on the development of CFD models and optimization methods. These are increasingly being used in the industry. Um, most of my students go into industry, for instance. Um, and basically, the reason that these are available is because of the dramatic increases in computer time and computer speed, uh, reductions in computer time, increases in computer speed, more than 10,000-fold over the last 15 years. So you can do stuff today that just we dreamt about uh, 15 years ago. And this really does re reduce the requirement for the expensive and difficult engine testing. Uh, development of predictive models, uh, more predictive, I should really say here, that account for physical processes. Uh, this has been another enabling factor that helped us to discover, uh, or is helping continuously helping, but it helped us in the past as well to, adv to discover advanced concepts. I believe that these tools are mature enough to guide the development of more efficient and cleaner internal combustion engines. There are new combustion strategies. The low temperature combustion is of interest because of the NOx control aspect, HCCI, PCCI, RCCI, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of other CCIs in the future. <laughs> uh, these offer the promise of dramatically improved engine efficiencies, which can be explored using the CFD tools that we've been discussing. If you look at CFD modeling itself, you know, it's come a long way from the 60s. Basically, uh, the initial CFD models were all based on thermodynamic analysis, the first law of thermo. Uh, we started to see one-dimensional and two-dimensional models in the 70s and 80s, eventually 3D models with meshes, adventurous simulations with one millimeter type meshes um, in the 90s. Uh, in the 2000s, you started to see the whole engine being included in a CFD model with the valves and uh, injection and so on. And extrapolating out by the 2020s, we'll be looking at all of the details inside the injector nozzle, resolving uh, many more scales in the gas phase with detailed kinetics and detailed spray processes. Uh, so this is a plot that Chris Rutland uh, put together uh, 20 years ago. And so here's... Uh, what's that, Moore's law, um, looking at uh, what's going to be happening to computers over time, starting in, in his case, around 1980, 1990, uh, going all the way through to 20, what's that say there, 40. Um, so in the early uh, 80s and 90s, most of the modeling was rents type modeling. Uh, in the next, uh, in the 20, 2000s up to 2020 or so, uh, his projection was that LES would start to see more and more applicability. And in fact, here are some results that, uh, from some of his work uh, where you compare experimental results obtained at Sandia National Lab with the corresponding uh, RANS uh, detail or reduced chemistry simulation. This is one cycle, right? One individual realization. The RANS is basically averaging this over many cycles. However, if you use an LES model, you can start to try to represent what you see in an individual cycle. So that's pretty exciting to be able to 
get closer fidelity between uh, an individual event and uh, the model. Uh, Chris has also spent some time working with DNS, and Mario Trujillo is our DNS guy now in, in our group. Uh, he's already started looking at sprays, uh, but there's some time between. That's going to be uh, practical uh, for um, engine application. His runs take about a month to run uh, one uh, diesel spray injection on you know thousands of computers. So this is kind of the trajectory. Um, uh, the dotted line here showed uh, some pessimistic projections of computer speed increase. I don't know where we really are going to be, but so far this line has been pretty accurate, so that's great. Okay, questions about that before I talk about the even long-term future. Thank you for that question. So the question was, why are we all here learning about physics when we can just get a big computer and solve everything with DNS? So that's a question that uh, I wish all of you will uh, consider, and uh, maybe my answer to it will be helpful to you. You're always going to need physics. Let's give you one example. Let's take a look at what happens when I add ethanol to gasoline. Okay, I showed you uh, when we were discussing vaporization that because ethanol is a polar molecule, it interacts with the other alkanes in the gasoline to depress the vaporization uh, boiling temperature. I don't care how fine your mesh, how many computers you have access to, if you don't account for that in your models, your physical models, you're not going to predict the vaporization of ethanol mixed with gasoline. And I'm just giving you one example there. Right? You can think of many similar examples. If you don't solve the right equations, it doesn't matter how many computers you're using or how fast they are, you're going to be potentially misleading yourself. So there's definitely uh, an important need to have combustion physicists and chemists and fluid mechanics people improving the state of knowledge of our models. So that goes hand in hand with what I'm saying here. The computers by themselves are only a piece of the equation or the piece of the pie. It's what goes into the computer that's the most important. I can discuss the soot models, I can discuss spray models, I can discuss turbulence models, I can discuss all of these things. I don't think that you can just resolve the problem by going to a bigger computer. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Any others? Okay, so let me finish up by talking about something that I thought was really interesting. This is a paper that I recommend that you look at if this is an area of interest to you. Uh, written uh, four or five years ago by Derek Abbott from Australia. And basically, he said, how are we going to supply the world with energy? Not tomorrow, not 10 years from now, not even 100 years from now, but for your grandchildren, you know, or great-grandchildren. How are we going to supply energy? And his, uh, as you'll see, his argument is that the sun is really the key to the future. So just to kind of back up his uh, reasoning, how much energy do we use at the time he wrote this paper? It's 15 terawatts. So that means that each of us on this planet, there's roughly six, maybe seven billion now, if we each run 25 100 watt light bulbs, that's how much energy we're using on this planet. I don't know how many light bulbs there are in this room here, but you can imagine, you know, my wife just made me put more light bulbs in the bathroom, so we probably have 20 of them in the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> But basically, it's still not as bright as when I walk outside into the sunshine, right? So there's a huge number of light bulbs in the, in the sun, all right? Uh, and that's what's shown over here when we compare energies. Uh, a flashlight is, you know, one watt. Um, New York is 13 gigawatts. Uh, the sunlight absorbed by the Earth is in the 10 to the 15 scale, all right? 
we have a huge amount of energy arriving on this planet from the sun. So that's uh, an important thing to point out. We use a lot of energy, but it's really quite small compared to what we're getting for free from the sun. So he asked this question. Imagine that we continue to use 15 terawatts, uh, and we want, to do, uh, we want to supply all of that energy with just one source of fuel. So he uh, estimated that if we look at the available uranium on this planet, we have enough for nuclear for five years. So we're supplying all of the energy that we currently use with just one energy source, nuclear. We have enough for five years. Fossil oil, his argument was 40 years. Natural gas, 60 years. Coal, 130. So these numbers you know, are pretty controversial, maybe. And we can squabble here. We can make that a 5, a 10, or we can make that 130. We can make 200. We can, we can argue, OK? But the point is that we're talking tens or hundreds of years, not thousands of years. And he's interested in the long term. Where are we going to get energy on this planet? The other thing is that we also still are going to need to make fertilizers, plastics, lubrication. And this is where some of these uh, really precious commodities are going to still be needed, right? And then he made a joke here, a billion years from now when our sun turns into a red giant, we'll need to escape the planet, some of us. <laughs> and we'll probably need some sort of nuclear power uh, to be able to fly to another solar system. So we don't want to use up all this stuff. Uh, in the long term. So, <clears throat> just I, uh, I thought this was interesting. If you think 5 billion people on the planet are driving a car with a 50 kilowatt engine for one hour a day, you know, maybe that's your commute, uh, that means we're using 10 terawatts. Um, so, you can see this is just not sustainable. I mean, that's uh, two thirds of the current world energy consumption. So, as more and more people avail themselves of transportation through uh, vehicle transportation. Uh, we just don't have enough energy. So his point is that we cannot continue to just recklessly use up non-renewable sources of energy. Uh, we have to consider alternatives. So he looked at fossil, nuclear, wind, hydroelectric, wave, geothermal. And basically, the only thing that we can think of for the long term is solar. And part of the reason for that is that a lot of these things are solar, like wind comes from the sun, right? Hydroelectric comes from the sun. Wave energy comes from the sun. So we're already using the sun when we start looking at those uh, energy sources. So the sun is uh, really the source of a huge amount of our potential future energy. And his argument was that from a sustainability perspective, one thing we have a lot of is water. So the hydrogen economy is really the direction that he thinks we should be looking. Uh, looking at the numbers here, the solar energy incident on the Earth in one month is more than all of the energy in the world's fuel resources, known resources, combined. Uh, so here are some numbers, 85,000 terawatts from uh, energy landing on our Earth here, uh, 7,000 in deserts. Um, ocean, wind, and so on. If you add up uh, these uh, sources plus the fossil sources, we, they pale in comparison to what we're getting from the sun. Um, this is just a plot that shows where the sun's energy is lying or, or uh, uh, heating our planet. Uh, usable solar power incident on the Earth is 5,000 times our global energy consumption. Deserts are 9% of the Earth's surface. If we tap sunlight on 1% of the Earth's surface at 1% conversion efficiency, we can meet the current world energy demand. A really strong argument for looking at solar. Okay, so already there's uh, huge uh, efforts to c uh, catch sunlight. Uh, here's a solar energy generating system in California uh, that he used as an example. And he said that in order to supply the world's energy, uh, if you had a field like this that was 320 kilometers by 320 kilometers, you'd supply the whole world's energy su supply. 
this one here uses these parabolic surfaces to heat up oil in these tubes here, which is then used to heat up water to create steam to drive turbines. So the idea then in his solar hydrogen economy is as follows. You have the sun, you collect solar energy focused on collectors and dishes and so on. You use that to create superheated steam, run steam turbines, extract energy in generators to produce electricity. This electricity can go to the grid, part of it used for desalination plants and so on, uh, then electrolysis to produce hydrogen, which could even be liquefied for some applications or use uh, the energy, the electrical energy, to uh, heat up st uh, stored water, produce hydrogen, burn the hydrogen in combustion, okay, not fuel cells, he's saying combustion here, uh, and then to catch the exhaust and recycle the water. So this is his uh, argument. Um, basically, this is a system that's completely recyclable, right? You start with water, you take sunlight, you convert it into uh, hydrogen, you burn it in combustion, and then you catch the exhaust gases and feed back the water. So if you look at uh, the history of transportation, um, we make these days about 60 million vehicles a year. Uh, one of the arguments in his paper is that if you look at batteries and uh, battery electric vehicles, we only have enough lithium on Earth to provide 23 years. This is with, if all transportation was going to be done with batteries. Fuel cells, he says, require exotic rare earth materials. Uh, there's only a limited supply of those on the planet. IC engine is a sustainable uh, power plant. It uses non-exotic materials, iron, uh, things that are widely available. That's why he says we should use an internal combustion engine and not a fuel cell. And this is an example here he gives of, okay, you're going to have an infrastructure that you're going to have to develop. When Henry Ford first developed his car here, you had to go and buy your gas in a can at a pharmacy. All right? uh, and he just, this is a reminder, he says that the infrastructure can co-evolve with the demand. If you look at what's available right now, BMW sells cars already that operate on hydrogen. Uh, this one is a, uh, a liquid hydrogen, um, cruising range 125 miles, uh, very good engine performance. Uh, Ford had a hydrogen vehicle, Mazda has hydrogen. Basically, if you think of it in these terms, an IC engine, that burns hydrogen, uh, if that's our future, you guys are going to be in business for the next billion years or so if you work on, hydro on internal combustion engines because that's going to be the future. Uh, that's going to be the engine for the future. <clears throat> okay, so that was his argument. He also says that, um, you know, in the really long term, we're going to have the sun for uh, billions of years. Eventually, the sun will become a red giant or whatever, and we're going to have to worry about that uh, a billion years from now. But for most of us in the room here, that's not going to be a problem. <laughs> so uh, these are the sorts of years that he says that you really can expect, uh, or the time scales that you can expect from these other sources. They're way, way shorter than the sun. OK, so this is, I think, my last slide here. Basically. Um, I think that the availability of cheap, cheap energy has really hurt us on this planet. We basically have distorted world economies and priorities. Uh, you know, if you think about it, uh, the reason that we can all exist is because we have enough food. Where did that food come from? It basically came from the use of fertilizers. Uh, and where did those fertilizers come from? It came from fossil fuels that we burn to create the ammonias and the... the, the the, uh, the fertilizer materials. If, you, if, if Hager and Bosch had not uh, discovered that process, we would have way fewer than 7 billion people on this planet. All of those people are using energy, right? So I think that you know, the fact that energy has been so cheap has allowed us to do things that are just totally not sustainable in the longer term. And in fact, the next 30 or 40 years uh, are really ripe for uh, 
introducing major innovations in internal combustion engines. We have dwindling resources. Uh, we also have environmental impact as that's being um, emphasized. Uh, and that the current usage rates are just unsustainable. Many uh, solutions and quotes are being proposed, especially by politicians. Uh, because the constituents in their state are pushing them to propose them for batteries, fuel cells, nuclear, and so on. But as you've seen in this article, this is short term, meaning uh, on a generation basis, if I measure short term, just a few generations are going to benefit from these things. The only really long term sustainable energy source is solar, so, and solar hydrogen, because we have tons of water. Uh, research will be needed, obviously, to improve the efficiency of electricity generation, hydrogen production and storage, and then the combustion process of hydrogen in engines. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that you should run today and give up everything and just work on hydrogen, because until you're able to switch to this hydrogen economy, we're going to need much more efficient use of fossil fuels and other fuels so that we can conserve them uh, and use them for the lubrication and those other th making of plastics and other things that are going to be needed three, four centuries from now. And then finally, this one here, this is uh, what uh, Thomas Edison told Henry Ford and Harvey Firestone in 1931. I'd put my money on the sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. So I think this is really consistent with Abbott's analysis. All right, that's all I wanted to say about internal combustion engines or reciprocating internal combustion engines. So any questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, as the uh, processor and computers are getting more powerful, like research and fuel economics for computer simulations and other kinds of experiments. So my question. So the question is, <clears throat> for your careers, what is the experimentalist going to be doing if computers are getting more and more powerful? Okay, well, let me tell you how I operate. And I have uh, my students, they, we meet in group meetings. Half of them are experimentalists and half of them are modelers. Because when the modelers show me results, I don't believe them until the experimentalists have verified them. And when the, the experimentalists show me their results and they tell me what actually happened, I don't believe that until I see the modelers uh, agree with them uh, and they reach some concurrence. So I think the two have to go together. Uh, basically, these advances that, that you're seeing here, the computers are just a tool. In other words, a computer is becoming like an experimental project. Uh, you're, uh, you're doing pretty much, you're using the same parts of your brain to analyze a lot of data from a computer run as you are analyzing the data from an engine experiment or a, a complex experiment. So that's my answer. Yeah. Right. 
the, that's a very good point. So your, your point is that uh, uh, we are very greedy people. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. And intrinsically, I think each of us knows that we shouldn't miss this, the space around us because it just doesn't seem right. And we have to rely on that instinct here. Uh, in other words, uh, at some point, you realize that you, know, you, you don't want to leave a mark uh, on this planet that's going to hurt your, your children or your children's children and so on. Uh, so that's kind of a flippant answer. But I think there's, from an intellectual point of view, there's other answers. And that is, we have the opportunity to uh, develop machines that allow us to move around this planet. Uh, we don't want to be wasteful for the first reason. What can we do to really improve the performance of those machines? Maybe the internal combustion engine is one strategy. It's survived a century or more. Maybe there's something else we can look at. So I think you can, you can have your cake and eat it in the sense that if you could come up with a strategy that allowed you to get 80, 90% efficiency from your, your uh, engine, uh, you would feel that you had accomplished something that benefited mankind as a whole. So, you know, I think you can have both. You can have the improved lifestyle uh, while you're also uh, addressing the need for you to get excited about what you do. I don't know if that's the answer that satisfies you, but, you know, when I think of... <laughs> when I think of the, uh, the electric motor, you know, it's 90% efficient. Whoa, or 99%. This is fantastic. The only thing you're worrying about is some friction and add a bit of oil and you've taken care of that. Well, where did you get the electricity? Well, you had to generate it someplace and that's only 30, 40, 50% efficient. So, you know, if, why is it so inefficient? That's where a combustion person really should be focusing their attention. What are those irreversibilities that are causing these losses in efficiency of converting fuel to uh, work, usable work? Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of work that's still needed to try to understand the constraints and to try to bypass them. Uh, the, the electric machines people uh, were kind of lucky in that sense that their, their systems are very efficient. Any more questions? Yeah. So you've shown us a lot of different models that you use uh, in your engine room. I guess the question that I had is, where do you feel the most opportunity for improvement in your engineering? Sure. Uh, so I write, write an opinion article that you can find in Combustion and Flame, uh, was it last year, I think, uh, where I discuss Diesel engines, spark ignition engines, compression ignition engines, um, low temperature combustion. And I kind of uh, am highly biased by uh, this low temperature combustion, uh, compression ignition strategy, simply because we've been able to demonstrate high efficiencies and low emissions. Now, it is true that if you look at an engine that has to cover a wide operating range, there's going to be problems uh, somewhere in that range or maybe several points in the range. But if you think of electrification, like with this hybrid vehicle, where you're running the engine at one operating point, you can really optimize the, the combustion process at that point and then rely on those efficient electric machines to take care of load transitions and so on. OK, so uh, where, do you, where is more research needed? Well, as I mentioned to you, we were getting from the, uh, the performance of the engine impressive efficiencies, but how can you go further? What's the next step? Uh, what, what do you need to do to the combustion process to actually improve efficiencies and reduce emissions even further? So, uh, you know, to me, that, that's the kind of uh, holy grail for engine research. For combustion research in general, though, you know, this is just one combustion device. I mean, furnaces, uh, gas turbines, uh, there are many different combustion devices, and each of them are going to have equivalent uh, problems, uh, efficiency, emissions, and so on. And so, uh, you know, 
I don't know how much low-hanging fruit there is in, in those other areas, but that would be something to look for, to see if you can take concepts from one developments in one area and apply them in another. So, for example, how about running an aircraft engine on two fuels? I don't know. Maybe there's some benefits. I haven't thought about it a lot, just as an example. So, in other words, being innovative, I think, is really part of what your future is going to represent. You're going to need to think outside the box. So again, it depends on what, you, what questions you're asking. So you want to know which models need more improvement. If, if, if you say to me that uh, you know, I'm going to be uh, interested in that big ship engine that I showed you uh, where the diameter of the piston is one meter, okay, and you tell me that the fuel that I'm going to use is right at the bottom of the barrel, uh, it's a horrible fuel. It has a lot of sulfur in it. It has, you know, very high molecular weight uh, compounds, aromatics, and so on. I'm going to have to spend most of my time understanding the chemistry of that fuel, if that's the problem that I'm going to be dealing with. All right. On the other hand, if I'm going to be designing a high-speed engine for a drone that's going to be used, uh, you know, in the in the military, let's say, I'm going to be looking at something completely different. I'll be looking at you know, flame propagation, if it's a spark ignition concept, or, uh, you know, compression ignition, maybe emissions are not so much of a concern there. So it really depends on the application. But it's the application that drives the research, you know, and uh, that's why that's a difficult question to answer. Even in the context of reciprocating engines, I mean, you know, as I've said, small engines, big engines, you will have different questions to address. I hope that answers that. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah, hydrogen has a really high octane number. So in a sense, it's kind of like uh, methane. You'll have the same problems that you have. Uh, you can, as we've discussed with natural gas, temper the octane number of the, of the natural gas or the hydrogen if you're using hydrogen in such a way as to control the reactivity. Uh, so hydrogen is kind of interesting because it's very hard to ignite, but it has a very high flame speed. So now you have to worry, okay, what combustion regime am I in? Am I in a, a compression ignition or am I dealing with flame propagation? And as I've tried to describe here, that's one area where we really don't have a good handle on the combustion is flame propagation and the transition from auto ignition to flame propagation. And then just to kind of finish off the discussion, if that flame propagates at velocities that are too high, you can undergo detonation or knock processes. And we really don't understand whether you're actually getting detonation waves or knock uh, is just a, a uh, volumetric auto ignition. So all of that, I think, would, you'd have to open up all those questions if you started looking at hydrogen as a, as a fuel, a substitute fuel. But that's interesting, right? Any other thoughts or questions? All right, well, thank you for all your questions, and I hope you enjoyed the lecture. <laughs> <laughs>